Hi everyone, this is Mike from the Comic Book Trove. I'm back today with another Omnibus review. Today I'm going to be taking a look at The Amazing Spider-Man Omnibus Volume 4. So we are at a point now where we, we should have Volume 5 finally released uh, in just a week or two from the time of recording this video. Um, very excited about that one. Can't wait to get it and add it to my collection, even if it's going to have a weird spine, but that's by the by. Um, but uh, yeah, so this is uh, Volume 4. Uh, I have previously covered Volumes 1, 2 and 3 on the channel in the past, so feel free to go back and check those out if, uh, if you haven't already and you're interested. But uh, yeah, so just want to move on with it really and carry on the series and uh, keep going through Spidey history. A few significant things going on in the material collected in this run. Uh, but first of all, if just take a look at the dust jacket. Uh, this was the direct market cover, the cover to uh, issue 135. There was a, an alternative cover, a variant cover, a bit of original artwork by Frank Cho. And I am a Frank Cho fan generally. I like quite a lot of his work, but um, the cover he did for this book just wasn't for me. Um, it is collected in the back of the book, so I'll show it off uh, probably towards the end when we get there. But yeah, so on the back you get your cover gallery, of course, and contents. So nice and straightforward as these kind of omnibus collecting classic material tend to be. This was before crossover fever struck the comic industry. Um, so you're just looking at Amazing Spider-Man issues 105 to 142, Giant Size Superheroes number 1, and Marvel Superheroes 14. Um, quite a big chunk of stuff, and as I say, you know, a few significant things to cover in here, and uh, I suppose one particularly significant event, and if you're familiar with this material, maybe if you're not so familiar with it even, chances are you know what I'm talking about already. Um, so, worth saying here then, there will be spoilers in this, in this discussion. Uh, as always, with my videos, this is probably going to turn out to be quite a long one, because I like to discuss these things in a fair amount of detail, um, and cover some key plot points as well. So I'm going to flick through a lot of the book. I won't be covering every single issue, every story arc, plot point, etc. But I will certainly cover some key stuff, so it's a spoiler warning here and now. If you don't want to know anything in any amount of real detail in here, if you want to check out the book yourself or read it elsewhere, without really knowing much, then you might want to come back and check this out later. So that's out of the way. Let's go through the book. So you got your initial kind of credits page. What you're getting in here initially, in terms of uh, significant for the series, is you get the final issues of Amazing Spider-Man that were written by Stan Lee. And then the introduction of his successor, only the second guy to become a regular writer of the series, which is Jerry Conway who was only, I think, 19 when he started writing this, which is absolutely unbelievable to think <laughs> that you take over from uh, take over writing from Stan Lee on The Amazing Spider-Man, Marvel's most popular, successful comic up to that point, as just a 19-year-old kid. Um, crazy, but yeah, it happened. And then, yeah, you get your contents page with, you know, original publication dates. I always love that added detail. Nice introduction by Roy Thomas there. And then you jump right into uh, to 105. So art throughout here, you know, much the same as the artwork through volumes two and three. Uh, you're getting a mixture of uh, Gil Kane, John Romita, and ultimately Ross Andrew. And all through this era of Spider-Man, you know, I've said this in my other reviews, but everything kind of running through um, the, the stuff from volumes two, three, and four here and onwards, through five, what we'll see in there as well. Really, really nice style of artwork. I really think that, you know, John Romita very much set the style for the other artists to that followed him to really kind of mimic, and which they all did. Uh, and, and it's just really nice. I, I, think, I think kind of silver and bronze age Spider-Man all looks really, really good. And that's not to take away from Steve Ditko, by the way. I'm not, uh, I'm not avoiding mentioning him on purpose. He's certainly got his own great art style. Uh, but for me, I just narrowly prefer the style that developed after Ditko left the book. Um, and I've just always really liked the way that uh, Romita, uh, who is still working on these issues, even when he's not officially penciling it, he's kind of uh, finishing it, you know? So he's got he's pretty much always had his, uh, his hand in the Spider-Man world from when he started working on it, even when he wasn't officially the artist anymore. He was still adding touches, and you can definitely see, I think, most prominently in the way he draws faces, because John Romita, to me, has an, a really, really kind of specific, easily identifiable style when it comes to the way he drew faces. When you see 
a John Romita face, you're like, yeah, Romita drew that. Um, and that's very much still prominent during this time. Because I think quite often, even when, for example, Gil Kane was the main artist, you know, you'd get Romita coming in and, and adding some finishing touches, and therefore his style would still be showing through in, in certain places. Um, Gwen Stacy, you know, looking absolutely beautiful during these issues, that Romita style. Um, the headband as well, I always thought that was quite cool. Very much uh, that kind of early 70s style, late 60s, early 70s. Um, and of course, Gwen is going to be a talking point in just a few issues once we get through uh, further into this book. Uh, yeah, poor Gwen. I'm already getting sad. But um, yeah, so some, <laughs> other than that, some really cool stuff going on. We get this issue here, which is really cool, which uh, prior to this, um, Flash Thompson had gone off to fight in the Vietnam War. And this issue, he actually recounts a story from whilst he was over there. And he kind of took refuge at this sort of temple place. And the temple ended up exploding. Um, it was attacked. And that has led to, you know, some people to be coming after him back in, uh, back in New York. And so Spidey's getting involved to try and protect him. And during this time as well, you know, what's... Uh, what was always good as well about Spider-Man, Amazing Spider-Man specifically, during this uh, era, I think, was how, you know, uh, character developments occurred. So, you know, right back at the beginning, Flash Thompson was pure and simple, just a bully who just bullied Peter Parker and generally caused him trouble. Uh, but during this time, they're actually friends, you know, and that further develops as the series goes on. So I kind of like that sort of development that you see. Really cool opening splash page here. Uh, and an issue guest starring uh, Doctor Strange as well. Of course, the two of them, Spidey and Strange, Steve Ditko's big two creations. So always kind of nice when you see them teaming up in a story. Um, this is a cool scene, actually. A really nice kind of Gwen moment. And when you know, when you look back, there's maybe not too many strong Gwen Stacy moments. She's very she was very often uh, underutilized, I think, as a character. She ended up often taking a back seat. She's a very passive character. Um, but this is quite a nice moment where you get Aunt May doing classic Aunt May things by just kind of dithering and doting, being a bit overly bearing on uh, Peter Parker. You know, always acting like he's the super fragile little boy. Um, and Gwen kind of snaps and she's just kind of like, uh, no, you know, you need to stop being this overly bearing mother figure. You know, he's not a child, he's a man. Um, it's just, yeah, I think Aunt May is just slightly infuriating at times because she's just such a liability to everybody, really. You know, she's just, I don't know. I, <laughs> maybe I'm sounding harsh, but to me, she's such a frustrating character. She's always kind of at death's door. Um, and these early years where Peter's got to just constantly worry about the slight possibility that she might have a full-blown panic attack just because of the slightest fright. It gets old fast. Um, but anyway, uh, issue 110. So this is the final issue that was written by Stan Lee, officially. There are a couple of issues after this that are credited to him, but they are actually... Um, issues that were reused from an earlier issue of the Spectacular Spider-Man magazine. So they're not original issues. So this was the last original issue to be written by Stan. Um, and I've got to say, he doesn't exactly go out on a high note because his last villain co-creation here, uh, certainly not one of Spider-Man's biggest, it's uh, the Gibbon, which is this guy in a monkey costume, basically. Well, a Gibbon costume. Uh, yeah, not exactly up there with the likes of uh, Green Goblin, Doc Ock, Mysterio, Scorpion, Rhino, etc. But there you go. They can't all be, uh, they can't all be hits when you come up with characters. Uh, and then you get Craven teaming up with the Gibbon. The Gibbon's just, uh, I don't know, such a hilarious character. But yeah, really nice artwork again. You know, I flick through these pages every time I see this stuff, I'm just kind of 
really impressed by it. I just really like it. So it's a great style. Um, yeah, so you get the introduction of uh, Hammerhead as well in these issues, who is uh, uh, another kind of gangster character, kind of similar to the Kingpin in a way, but uh, I think Hammerhead tends to be a bit more directly involved in the fights than Kingpin tends to be. Oh yeah, so these, so Aunt May again, honestly, she's just it's frustrating. So in these issues and beyond, she's got it into her head that Doc Ock is some great hero, uh, despite the fact that he's an incredibly well-known supervillain. Um, but she thinks he's a nice man who's misunderstood and that Spider-Man's the ultimate villain because she's the most gullible woman in the world. So... Yeah, <laughs> don't know what to say about that other than it's an annoying issue where Aunt May gets in the way, but that's a common thing whenever she's involved, uh, especially during this time where it seems like they were going out of the way to make her even more frustrating. Um, so yeah, that's in there. We haven't even got to the point where she decides to marry him yet because yes, that's a thing. Aunt May tries to marry Doc Ock at one point in this book. Uh, these are the issues that uh, I was talking about that technically it's Stan Lee as the writer, but these were all previously used, these stories and these three issues, uh, in the Spectacular Spider-Man number one black and white graphic novel. And that's collected in volume two of these omnibuses. So if you had read that and then you got here, and this all seemed extremely familiar, like you're having deja vu, that's because you have seen it before. I think they did slightly extend the story though to fit it into these issues. Like slightly uh, changed some things around a little bit, but 90% is the same story. And it's all about a uh, corrupt politician basically, who is popular with the people, but turns out to be a bad guy. Not the best story, but it's, uh, you know, it's okay. And then we get to the last story before the big one, uh, which is a fight with the Hulk. Not Spidey's first encounter with the Hulk, but, uh, you know, still an interesting one. Artwork great, as always. But I think that this short story is pretty much uh, massively overshadowed by what comes after it. Which we're about to get to here. So, uh, issue 121. Uh, yeah, hugely significant issue. Of course, this issue is the one... Uh, well, this issue and its follow-up are where we see Gwen Stacy uh, die. And she gets killed. And, you know, pretty much immediately after, Green Goblin, Norman Osborn, also gets killed. So, very much a hugely significant couple of issues here. Massively so. Um, all begins with, uh, you know, for quite a while up to this point, Norman Osborn has been having intermittent amnesia. So he would come back because the goblin for a, sp uh, a fight with Spidey. Spidey would kind of knock him out. And then he'd be an amnesiac again. And then 20 issues later or whatever, he'd remember his green goblin and the process would repeat. So here we have one of his moments where he remembers he's the goblin, remembers he hates Spider-Man. Um, and yeah, so he comes for Gwen here in this pretty iconic panel. Uh, Spidey comes home, realizes the goblin's taken her finds them on the bridge, and this is just, you know, super well-known, famous story. Almost feels silly summarising it, but um, 
Yeah, so you get this page here, of course, the the moment, the big moment where she's thrown off by the goblin. Spidey slings a web, tries to catch her. He does catch her, but the momentum of the sudden, you know, shift in momentum uh, of being caught midair like that. Uh, we see this little snap. So the indication being that uh, she was stopped with too much force and her neck broke. Pretty horrible. Um I'm genuinely really sad and you know this final splash page here and you know we revealed the title at the end at the night Gwen Stacy died uh, and then it's follow-up which picks up literally directly afterwards in the same scene Spidey holding her body really kind of powerful images you know to this day these issues are I think nearly 50 years old now this story but to this day it's still very powerful one you know even when you read it now even when you're fully aware of what's coming uh, it's quite hard hitting and you can't help but feel but feel uh, very sad for poor Gwen you know the first real casualty of comics you know as, as a side character you know, this was very much the death that uh, shocked readers at the time because previously Regular supporting characters, you know, they'd get captured and kidnapped, they'd be in danger. But in the end, the hero would, would always end up saving them. So to have an example here where she was very much dead was a big deal and a big change in comics. Not just for Amazing Spider-Man, but in general, it kind of shifted forward to a new era. Um, some people cite that as the end of the Silver Age of comics and the transition into the Bronze Age. I would argue it actually already, already happened prior to this, but certainly... If it wasn't already solidified as a, as a change in in comics, then this moment was a big one in doing it. Uh, but this ending as well, just want to really kind of mention this when Mary Jane appears and uh, she's trying to comfort Peter and he kind of snaps at her, and tells her that, you know, what does she care anyway? You know, she's always the just the party girl who doesn't want to be serious for more than a second at a time. Um, and she starts to leave, but then doesn't. You know, she makes the decision that she's going to stay. Really nice use of just artwork, you know. At a time where most panels are full of text and dialogue, I just like this short little three-panel sequence at the end where she makes that decision to stay and support him because she knows he's going through a horrible time. Um, but what's good about that as well is that it doesn't just get forgotten. You know, you don't read issue 122 and it's all done there and then it's just back to web slinging and <laughs> making quips as he's fighting villains. The death of Gwen very much remains kind of a prominent thing that is shown to be affecting Peter for quite a while afterwards, you know, in, in subsequent issues. So it keeps coming up, he keeps having these moments where he'll just suddenly remember her um, and feel guilt, sadness. Uh, yeah, so it's, it's, it's well written, it's pretty well handled. Um, especially by the fact when you think that Conway was such a, a young writer at the time when he was doing this. Very kind of serious thing to start your your writing career out with in a in an ongoing series. But yeah, I think overall handled pretty well. But don't get me wrong, it's not like it's a, a super downbeat series from this point onwards. It still has its moments. Uh, well, it's not so much that it has its moments. It still is for the most part. You know, just classic Spidey stuff. It's just that every now and then he'll have those moments where he, he remembers Gwen. Which, to be fair, those moments have kind of continued ever since. You know, to this day, I think you know, there's still stories where now and then Gwen will come up and he'll remember her. For whatever reason. Um... But yeah, and you still get some absolutely wacky villains. So don't think the days of wacky villains are gone just because you move into the Bronze Age. You've still got, for example, the kangaroo, a man who jumps really high. Um, you know, why hasn't he been in an MCU film yet? Come on, guys, bring in the kangaroo. Um, yeah, so, it, you know, overall, it's it's very much classic stuff. You know, that's, that's what I would say. I'm a big fan of, as I say, Silver and Bronze Age Spidey. <laughs> it's an incredibly 70s uh, Mary Jane style outfit there. Um, and 
And yeah, so you're getting classic villains. You got the Vulture still turn up. Obviously, Doc Ock, who we've already seen. The Goblin was obviously gone at this point. And what's has been interesting as well, you know, Norman Osborn's been been brought back, you know, quite a long time ago now. But uh, he did actually stay dead for a long time in the comics, which is saying something for comics. I think he was gone for about twenty odd years, you know, after he died in that issue. Um, and there were other Green Goblins, you know, mostly Harry Osborn. You know, he took up the mantle for a bit. Um, and there was the Hobgoblin, obviously. So we weren't completely without a Goblin in Spider-Man. But uh, Norman Osborn himself was actually gone for a while. So it's a death that was certainly lasting for a while. Um, yeah, of course, so 129, the first appearance of the Punisher. And you start to see as well uh, this new villain, the Jackal, who starts coming in. And he, uh, there's kind of an ongoing subplot involving the Jackal for a while now. It starts to build and he starts to appear more and more often. He's got it out for Spider-Man. You don't know who he is. But as these issues proceed, it becomes clear that he's formulating a plan to take revenge against Spider-Man for some reason. This is a really cool issue. I've always really liked that. I've actually got a t-shirt with that cover on the front really nice ridiculous though obviously but it's cool features spidey the spider buggy classic hammerhead the jackal uh yeah an exciting cover uh because you do get the spider mobile the spider buggy shows up in, in these pages where despite the fact he can't even drive never mind doesn't need to drive spider-man agrees uh, <laughs> to, to have this car designed for him by some company. I think in the real world the reason for that, uh, I don't really remember exactly, but I think it was to try and sell some toys or something, something like that. Um, but anyway, it was super ridiculous and it's even acknowledged in the story, to be fair, how ridiculous it is. So they were at least doing that, pointing out that there is zero need for Spider-Man to have a car. Um, but yeah, anyway, it's all fun. This is the issue where, um, yeah, this is the one where Aunt May is on the verge of marrying Doc Ock. Honestly, that woman is just ridiculous. The hassle that she causes, honestly. Um, yeah, the, reintrodu uh, the reintroduction of the Molten Man. So he is a character who goes right back to the Ditko era. I think this is also where uh, the character of Liz Allen is reintroduced. And she had kind of just disappeared without a trace again back in the Steve Ditko era. I think she last appeared in issue 20 something, you know, and then she suddenly came back here nearly 100 issues later. And it turns out that she uh, is related to the Molten Man. I think she's his stepsister or cousin, something like that. Can't remember exactly. But yeah, she turns out to be related to him, and that she's been trying to care for him, but yeah, it's not going well. Hence the reason he's basically on fire. Because when you're on fire, I think it's safe to say things aren't going that well for you. Um, yeah, and uh, he, I think he's literally melting away. That's what's going on in this story. Uh, okay, so then you've got uh, Morbius, giant-sized superheroes. It's very much a kind of uh, hammer horror kind of thing with the man-wolf and Morbius both appearing. Like Spidey's stuck in a cheesy horror flick. But that's always been... I think one of the great things about reading Spider-Man is that perfect balance of, you know, things can be absolutely silly and ridiculous um, and still feel serious in a way. And uh, it's just always been a really fun series, I think, more so than many other series. If you go back and read Spidey from the very beginning and all through this point, you know, I think I really think that Spider-Man was a, a comic that was great from the beginning and, you know, just continued to stay great or, you know, even getting better. Uh, 
so this issue, I've got to say here, this is like the most maniacal looking I think Mary Jane has ever appeared. She isn't supposed to look like that. It's not, but you would think if you didn't have dialogue to accompany that, you would think that she's suddenly gone a little bit uh, off the deep end. <laughs> it's just an odd panel. Always struck me as an odd expression, but anyway. Uh, yeah, basically what happens here is a tarantula is introduced and he is taking over this cruise ship. So Peter throws himself overboard so that he can reappear as Spider-Man. Um, but what I like about this issue is that Flash Thompson actually starts to get suspicious of him here. You know, kind of finally someone's saying, hang on a minute, how come Spidey appeared right after you just conveniently fell overboard? And then as soon as Spidey disappeared, you suddenly came back unharmed. You know, just that classic sort of thing. Somebody finally poking holes in this pretty, uh, pretty bad cover story that he always manages to, uh, to use. And then you get the, well, you start to get the development of Peter Parker and Mary Jane's relationship, you know, around this time. Um, but it's an odd one, really. So with Peter and MJ, the, they didn't get straight together after Gwen, you know, which I think is a bit of a misconception sometimes. Um, they start kind of dating and getting a little bit closer to each other in these issues and, and the issues afterwards. Um, but ultimately, they don't, not at this point. And there is actually... A point where Mary Jane leaves the story, the series completely. They just kind of write her out of it, and she didn't come back for ages, until years later, like real world years later. But yeah, so this is where you start to get Harry, Os Harry, Harry Osborn, Harry Osborn, um, appearing as the Goblin taking over his father's mantle, you know, blaming Spider-Man for his dad's death. Um, you know, elements that were used in the, uh, the Sam Raimi trilogy. Oh yeah, so in this issue, to kind of just go back to that point again about um, Peter and Flash's friendship developing, uh, at this point, I think they're actually roommates. So, you know, kind of cool, I think how that relationship developed from bully and victim in high school to actually both maturing and getting over that, forgiving each other, moving on, becoming actually becoming friends. One of the more just generally kind of nice character developments, I think, in comics. And yeah, you know, Liz Allen continually guest appearing from this point. It is strange, honestly, the way she vanished. Because when she last appeared, there was no kind of fanfare to it. No reason to suggest she would not be appearing in comics again for who knows how many years. But then she just walks back into the series one day. It's like uh, like they just realised, oh yeah, Liz Allen. I remember her. Let's put her in a story. But he, you know, the Jackal, you know, his plan coming together. Um, doesn't really look like a Jackal, though. I've always thought that, you know, if, if you saw him wearing that costume, Jackal is not really the name that springs to mind. He's more like a goblin or a gremlin. But I guess that they didn't want to have things get confusing, given that there's already been a goblin character. And then these final two stories, which feature Mysterio and Spidey getting rid of his uh, his buggy, driving it off into the river. And, you know, I'll always say that when you get Mysterio involved in a story, it just opens the door for fun storytelling, really. Because if everything can be an illusion, everything can be fake and made up, it just gives the writer and the artist a good excuse to just play around with crazy concepts. Since in the end you can just go, ah, none of it was real. And yeah, so there we end on uh, issue 142. Um, just a bonus star in the back, an issue of Marvel superheroes.
and then the extras. And you, know, you get the usual kind of stuff, some alternative covers, ads, interviews, a word search, if you feel like writing in your omnibus. That's a really cool cover image. Um, kind of John Romita self-portrait with the various cast of uh, the series. So yeah, just various things in here. Quite a lot of stuff actually. Quite a few pages of extras in here. So this book, you know, it's a uh, it's out of print, I believe, at the moment. I think it has been for a while, actually. Um, but I feel like it's probably a safe assumption that Marvel will reprint it. I would say, if I had to honestly guess on it, I would say it'll probably get reprinted next year at some point. Next year will be the 60th anniversary of Spider-Man. So I feel like Volume 1 will probably get another reprint. This will probably get another reprint. Uh, well, a first reprint, so a second printing overall. And uh, yeah, hopefully some other original stuff as well that's not been collected in this format before, but we'll see. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so thanks guys for watching this all the way through. I hope that's been uh, of some interest, of some use to anybody interested in the book. Now I've got volumes one to four under my belt. Now I've got reviews up for each of those, so you can watch these all the way through. Um, and yeah, I'm feeling ready for volume five to come in now. And once I do get that in, uh, I'll definitely be doing an overview on it, so watch out for that in the next couple of weeks. Hopefully we get that on time, so I'll get that up as soon as I can. But again, thanks for watching as always. I'll be back again soon, and uh, we'll take a look at something else. Thanks, guys.